Examining Ethics with Andy Collison is hosted by the Janet Prindle Institute for Ethics at DePaul University. Point number two reads, Big Oaks contains the danger of property damage and permanent, painful, disabling, and disfiguring injury or death due to the presence of expended but still live bombs, rockets, cannon rounds, flares, and other types of warheads. Unexploded munitions may be encountered anywhere within Big Oaks, lying on the ground or completely buried. These munitions can still explode, though they may have lain in the ground for decades. I have been instructed not to approach or disturb any military equipment or ordnance discovered on Big Oaks. If encountered... Oh, Christian, what are, we, what are we watching here? <laughs> what, what is this? So this is part of a safety video that visitors are required to watch before you go to the Big Oaks National Wildlife Refuge in Madison, Indiana. What? Wait, what? <laughs> why, why, why do you have to watch this at a wildlife refuge? So I thought the same thing. Um, but Big Oaks used to be called um, the Jefferson Proving Ground. And it was basically like a giant piece of land that the U.S. Army used to test guns and bombs, um, including nuclear bombs, um, between 1945 and 1995. And now it's a wildlife refuge. They turned it into a wildlife refuge. But it's the kind of refuge where you can obviously still see signs of like the old military uses. That's mind blowing. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, so America is kind of chock full of places like this, like huge patches of land that have been abandoned and like now sit vacant. And let's say you have an old site like that Jefferson Proving Ground, and you want to take all of that unused land and turn it into a wildlife refuge. Sounds awesome, right? Um, but how would you go about doing that? Well, you could just tear down the army buildings and take it back to some kind of uh, some kind of pre-human wilderness. That's exactly what my intuition would be. And I think for a lot of people, that's what they're thinking when they hear something like ecological restoration. But on today's show, we'll learn about an idea that is shifting the way people think about the ethics of restoring a place like Big Oaks. It's called layered landscapes. Layered as in like cake layer yeah exactly all right i'm i'm interested uh take it away today's episode is about the ethics of ecological restoration we're going to hear from marion hurtican and david havlick who edited the book restoring layered landscapes Together with Joe Robb, the manager of Big Oaks National Wildlife Refuge, they explain the concept of layered landscapes, which is helping to reshape how restorationists ought to approach their work. So last January, I visited Big Oaks in southern Indiana. Driving into this wildlife refuge is so different than entering any other national park I've ever been to. The first thing you see is a huge rusty sign that says U.S. Army Jefferson Proving Ground. Big Oaks is one of many Military to Wildlife, or M2W, sites across America. I spoke with the refuge manager, Joe Robb. My name's Joe Robb. I'm the refuge manager at Big Oaks National Wildlife Refuge, and I'm the project leader of Big Oaks and Muscatic National Wildlife Refuge Complex. As he drove me around on that rainy January day, he told me that places like Big Oaks have a slightly different mission than most national parks. So we're a national wildlife refuge, which is a little bit different. We have a sister agency, the National Park Service. Our mission is for wildlife to keep the wildlife going for the future benefit of Americans. At Big Oaks, the mission is to conserve wildlife. But unlike many national parks, they're conserving wildlife in a landscape that was once used to test guns and explosives for the military. The unique character of a landscape like this means that how one might go about the ecological restoration there is important. Traditionally, when restorationists began restoring a landscape, they chose a reference condition or a reference point that guided their choices. In traditional ecological restoration, the reference point was often pre-human, pre-European, or pre-settlement. This basically meant that they tried taking the land back to some kind of imagined pure wilderness, stripping away the layers of human interaction with the land. But according to the scholar Marian Hurtican, 
thinking about ecological restoration in this way can be problematic. Sometimes it might that that model might work, um, and there might be good reasons to do to follow that traditional model where you uh, try and scrape away the human influence and bring back uh, something approximating a, a natural system free of human influence. But I think um, the model is problem in a, problematic in many contexts uh, because it sometimes focuses on one layer at the expense of others, uh, for example. So often in North America, uh, the kind of baseline condition for restored sites is thought of as, um, or at least historically, was thought of as sort of pre-European settlement types of conditions. And other, many scholars have pointed out that using that baseline either sort of naturalizes the influence of uh, indigenous peoples on the landscape or just ignores it altogether. And according to Joe Robb, returning to a pre-settlement reference point is often unrealistic. Things have changed through time, nothing static, climate's changing, uh, rain patterns are changing. The soils here are different than what they were naturally. Plus we have rare species here that are nowhere else. And so if you let it go back, you're letting, you know, rare and endangered species potentially be uh, affected. Marion Hurtican and David Havlick say that a way of changing this problematic paradigm of ecological restoration might be by considering something called layered landscapes. The term layered landscape really refers to landscapes that have complex socio-ecological histories and landscapes often that change in important ways over time, uh, change in land uses or change in ecological systems. We like the term layered landscapes because it calls attention to the temporal and kind of longitudinal dimensions of these places. In some respects, every landscape is layered. We're trying to, I think, attend particularly to landscapes where those various prior uses and prior histories seem to have some special significance and where the meanings that we might carry forward from those prior uses or prior activities um, matter and, and ought to make a difference in terms of how we continue to exist uh, in certain places. So throughout time, landscapes collect the marks of history. Let's say you're looking at an open field. That field hasn't always looked like that. Maybe 50 years ago, it was a farm. Before that, it might have been a clearing created by an indigenous community. Before that, it could have been a cluster of trees. Every piece of land has accumulated a history over time. And that history isn't just about humans in the land. Animals and weather change the landscape, too. And all those bits of human history and natural changes get layered over top one another through time. If every site were to be restored in the traditional way, taking it back to some pre-settlement reference point, you basically end up scraping away or hiding the layers of human influence. However, in a restored landscape like Big Oaks, some of the layers of human influence on the natural world have been left in place. There's often no distinction between wilderness and the marks left behind by the military. Here's Joe Robb again. And you can see a lot of mounds off to the side there. Those are crayfish, burrowing crayfish mounds, and so a lot of animals use those burrows, and one of them is a crawfish frog, which is a very rare species, and probably the most of the crawfish frogs in the state are right here. So it's it's a state endangered species. So this is where they had the guns set up, and they shot down range into impact fields, and they had people set out there watching to see those tests to see if they would work and function. Big Oaks isn't the only military site that's been converted to a wildlife refuge. In a place like the Rocky Mountain Arsenal near Denver, Colorado, the former uses of the site aren't as obvious as they are at Big Oaks. Much of the evidence of human interaction with that landscape has been erased. In the early 1940s, the federal government built a chemical weapons plant on the land. It was later used by the Shell Company to produce pesticides. 
in the you know waning decades of the 20th century and, and uh, continuing into the early 2000s, uh, they began a uh, cleanup of the site and ultimately did a like a multi-billion dollar cleanup. Um, they removed many of the contaminated materials, concentrated some of the remaining contamination from the site into uh, some cap and cover landfills, and then began this massive prairie restoration effort. Um, now they've reintroduced bison. I mean, it's this now it's this wildlife refuge that's um, really rich. Um, but if you go to the site today, I think. Um, we have found in surveys that visitors sometimes, despite the name Rocky Mountain Arsenal, don't realize that this uh, place has a very complex history that included uh, chemical weapons production. So I think the idea of layered landscapes is to think about, okay, let's not erase all that complex history, um, or let's at least consider how that history might be actually preserved on the landscape itself. Because I guess I would say that the Arsenal has a great visitor center that does portray this this history, um, but unless you're kind of sensitive to to subtle cues on the landscape that there are trees that were planted in straight rows or that there are other elements of prior uh, military use, um, you may not uh, realize the sort of the, the depth of um, the kind of social, cultural, political um, history and significance of the place. According to David, when the Rocky Mountain Arsenal stopped chemical production, the immediate response was to get rid of the manufacturing plant's infrastructure. You know, within about 10 years, there was this determination that, that it would be a wildlife refuge and that we should return the site to, you know, a quote-unquote natural state. And so I, I think, especially in North America or in the U.S., the temptation has been um, to eradicate as many signs of that military period as possible. And, and we still, I think, have this broad cultural orientation in, in the U.S. to the frontier, at least in the Western U.S., this seems prevalent, um, that if we can bring sites like the Rocky Mountain Arsenal back to their, their pre-settlement or their frontier condition, that that's desirable, that that's a, um, a success story. But David says that when we take away the human layers of a landscape... It, I think it allows us to disregard the very real sacrifices that were made in that site. You know, lives were, were dramatically disrupted at that site. The, the farming families were given less than 30 days' notice to, ev to evacuate. And um, even before, you know, they had a chance to clear out the army was moving in and building this chemical weapons you know, manufacturing plant. And the, the surrounding communities of Commerce City and Montbello for, for four decades suffered from noxious fumes and contaminated groundwater and, you know, the, the sort of side effects of um, really the direct effects of chemical production facilities being right across the street from them. And, and, and then sort of also just that, that broader commitment that we as a country made to creating weapons of mass destruction, which, um, you know, in more recent years, uh, it, we would be shocked, I think, to, to sort of imagine ourselves embracing a chemical weapons manufacturing plant going, being, being assembled right in the, in the midst, basically, right on the edge of a major city. But I think, it, I think there's important lessons there about who we are and where we've come from as a country that we were willing to, to, to make these sacrifices uh, in this place and to just sort of have that washed away then or obscured um, by removing infrastructure, I think, is, um, is unfortunate. And, and, and maybe sort of more serious than that is, is really damaging to the, the prospect of learning from our history. So when we remove the traces of human interaction with the land, we lose. We lose out on history. And so when we remove all the, the infrastructure at a place like the Rocky Mountain Arsenal, I think it becomes quickly tempting to just think of this place as nature. And when we do that, then I think some of the really important lives that, that were committed to this place and the environmental impacts and kind of the politics and the, um, the, the whole sort of political economy of that place vanishes as well. And as Marion points out, we also lose a very important reminder that humans can and do permanently change the natural world. 
when you go to a site like the Arsenal, it's beautiful. It looks natural. People describe it as sort of pristine, you know, in all these ways that, um, with all these adjectives that we use to describe natural places, in the, you know, at that site, there are still these huge landfills full of toxic waste. You don't see them necessarily as a visitor, um, but you know, m keeping that history uh, visible or available to us, I think, does help us contend more seriously with the gravity of what we're doing uh, in certain places that is really almost irreversible or um, irreversible in terms of um, in terms of contaminating sites without just a tremendous uh, influx of resources. So if restorationists acknowledge the layers in a landscape, they can then do something critical, which is to acknowledge the complexity of the relationship between humans and nature. According to Marion and David, that complexity can shape how they approach restoration. A lot of the traditional models for thinking about ecological restoration don't neatly apply in layered landscapes. The, the kind of original paradigm for ecological restoration um, is one where you have a natural landscape and then you have a, a somewhat discrete human disturbance and then restoration tries to bring that landscape back to the condition prior to disturbance. Um, layered landscapes kind of problematize that simple model um, because there's no sort of discrete moment where humans intervene. Um, the interaction between humans and nature is ongoing and, and um, over time. And um, I think the other important dimension here is that uh, it's not always clear in these landscapes that human influence should be understood as disturbance. So basically, I think the, um, the concept of layered landscape sort of problematizes and kind of brings to the fore questions about how we set restoration goals and what, uh, what we aim to bring back to the land. Bringing in the idea of, of layered landscapes more explicitly highlights that the complexity of reference condition and, and highlights that we shouldn't take for granted that there is sort of a preordained state to which we should restore something, but that that requires active choices and um, kind of intentionality on the part of, of restorationists to think about, well, why are we restoring this place to this particular set of processes or conditions? And what assumptions are we building into that? And what are we missing perhaps of significance if we choose one condition over another. It isn't enough just to acknowledge the layers in a landscape, though. Marion argues that restorationists should also attend to the virtue of receptivity, as outlined by philosopher Michael Sloat. The notion is, I think, one that's kind of intuitive. It's related to a kind of openness, um, a willingness to engage with what the world presents to you. Um, and in some ways, Sloat describes receptivity in contrast with um, a more kind of imposing, planning, controlling kind of uh, approach to the world. It allows us in approaching restoration to think in ways um, that take account of the, the landscape and its history um, without sort of coming with a particular template or model for restoration. That kind of receptivity and openness may allow us to see possibilities that we wouldn't have envisioned in advance, perhaps, um, and to take advantage of what the landscape as it currently exists might offer us in some sense. Marion told me that Big Oaks National Wildlife Refuge is an example of allowing receptivity to shape restoration goals. Interestingly, the use of that site um, by the Army resulted in um, 
open grassland habitat, they couldn't shoot, it's hard to test munitions in like a closed forest. So they would mow and um, otherwise kind of uh, keep the forest at bay. But the um, effect of that was that it created grassland that's really valuable bird habitat for birds like Henslow sparrow. So the managers are actually maintaining some of these human created landscapes as wildlife habitat and as a way of um, maintaining sort of the diversity of habitat types that now exist in that place. I think if you came into that place and said, well, uh, it was forest, so to forest it must return, you would miss this opportunity of being kind of receptive to what's there now and uh, why it might have value. And also the value of this, you know, habitat type in the context of the larger landscape outside the refuge and uh, the relative rar rarity of habitat that supports these kinds of birds. Rare bird populations like Henslow sparrow are able to live in a place like Big Oaks because it retains traces of the former military site. Refuge managers like Joe Robb actively maintain certain aspects of the military landscape to support rare and endangered species. And so some of the grasslands you see as burns, but that keeps the grasslands and shrubs kind of at a state where those species are benefited. And some of the areas we're letting it go back into forest. So typically what we look at is like right here, you're in kind of a shrubland, woodland, grassland area where we're burning and keeping areas at a certain state. Other areas we're not burning as frequently and we're allowing it to revert to forest. Do you ever get to burn we, the yes, grassland? Yes, we, it's our staff. We have fire qualified folks on staff and we have a fire management officer that prepares plans and we decide what areas we're going to burn, and we burn probably about nine to 10,000 acres a year. Does that feel like just part of your job, or does that ever feel kind of yucky? No, it's actually, a... it's actually kind of fun. It's a very uh, fun time to get out there because we know that it gives positive things to the habitat. Uh, we work as a team, and it's something that humans on Earth have been doing using prescribed fire to influence habitats. The Native Americans did it in these areas here to keep the bison from coming down. Oxford University Press has generously provided us the books that we are discussing on the show today. To find out more about Oxford University Press, visit them on the web at global.oup.com. Oxford University Press has kindly offered to provide you, the listener, with a 30% discount on Restoring Layered Landscapes, edited by Marion Hurdekin and David Havlick. So to get a link for a 30% discount on Restoring Layered Landscapes, visit our show notes page at examiningethics.org. Thanks again to Oxford University Press for their help with today's show. So we've discussed the virtue of receptivity and the part that it plays in restoring layered landscapes. According to Marion, narrative also plays an important role when considering the ethics of ecological restoration. The stories people tell about a place can highlight the interconnectedness between humans and landscape. When I talk about narrative um, in the book, um, I'm building on work that's been done by um, other philosophers, Alan Holland, Andrew Light, John O'Neill, who suggest that we should be more attentive to more specific, rich narratives of place that um, bring out the ways in which uh, people understand places to have meaning in their lives. Um, and I think, you know, their argument is in part that um, one that's sort of framed in response to kind of utilitarian ways of thinking about things where you kind of add up costs and benefits you, you, of, of different alternatives. And um, their suggestion is that kind of enumerating approach and aggregating approach doesn't actually bring out the relationships between values or the way that things hang together. Um, so I think narrative can be promising in restoration because it can reveal 
sort of the rich ways in which people and landscapes um, or people and ecosystems are intertwined and interact and how those relationships are sources of meeting. She says that attending to narrative can highlight the importance of relational ethics in thinking about the environment and restoration. But narrative can also be complicated. There's no single narrative of a place, right? So if you ask 10 different people who live near a place or around a place or people who come to visit a place um, and learn about the history, they're going to tell the story of that place in probably 10 different ways. Um, And sometimes those narratives are actually... um, in conflict with one another. So that's that, that poses a challenge, which narrative, um, you know, even if we're gonna use narrative to guide restoration, which one do we choose? But then I think more generally, all narratives need to be engaged critically. Um, I, I think just because there, you know, a place has a story doesn't necessarily mean that that story should be continued. I mean, there are sometimes narratives that are bad or problematic um, that involve, you know, oppression of people or marginalization of people or domination of the, you know, and damage to the landscape that we, w- we would want to actually think about how we might rewrite the narrative or, or alter it. Um, so there are some people who are developing methods that sort of encourage people to use narrative um, both to articulate the ways in which they value places and places have meaning to them and then also to kind of mediate um, among those conflicting stories. So there are efforts um, to think about how people might co-construct a new narrative for a place that perhaps integrates aspects of different narratives and tries to reconcile them. There is a potential to think about, well, how could we um, together envision um, an alternative narrative that, that might guide us going forward. When I spoke with Marion, I was really taken by this idea that narrative could help guide the restoration of layered landscapes. Actually, everything about my discussions with Marion and David stuck with me. If any of my colleagues were here, they'd tell you I wouldn't shut up about it, even in other interviews. I want to close our episode today with some thoughts from a conversation I had with Kyle White. My name is Kyle White, and I work at Michigan State University. I hold the Timnick Chair in the Humanities, and I'm an Associate Professor of Philosophy and Community Sustainability. Faithful listeners will recall him from a recent episode about climate justice. I brought up the idea of layered landscapes when we spoke about ecological restoration. For him... Restoration is not just about restoring human relationships with the land. It's also about restoring human relationships with each other. So I'm wondering, you know, if you're talking about a landscape that is kind of layered and has all of this, like, it's got, you know, indigenous layers, and then it's got settler colonial layers, and then it's got whatever else, whatever, whatever other kind of layers, like, where do you kind of, how do you figure that out? Right. And, and that's, I think, one of the key questions for uh, people that are doing ecological restoration, because as you say, for um, so many years, you know, especially, uh, you know, white people in the settler society thought that you'd sort of pick a point in time, a particular landscape, and then restore that, and there'd be very little human involvement afterwards. Yet for literally hundreds of tribes, you know, just thinking on the U.S. side, they've been engaging in restoration that instead of just sort of picking, you know, time T and trying to restore that, right, the idea is actually how do you restore the human connection to, you know, a landscape or a plant or animal or an environment, right? And now for for the tribes that do this, the Little River Band of Odawa Indians in Michigan, you know, has a phenomenal sturgeon restoration program. And the way that they do it, right, is that sturgeon restoration is actually not just about um you know, restoring a certain number of sturgeon. Um, you know, sturgeon was a traditional fish for them and major part of their culture and their diet. Um, but actually, it's about creating an overall program that can help repair the relationships that they have with the settler society surrounding them in Michigan. And so, what that means is they actually create and occurs every year in September a public ceremony. Um, to release the sturgeon that are big enough to survive um, out in the uh, out in the river there, and what that ceremony does is it 
it conveys a number of ideas. It conveys the history of settler colonialism, which led to the collapse of the sturgeon population. It conveys scientific understanding of sturgeon. It conveys tribal traditions about sturgeon. And then when each person gets to take a bucket and release one of the sturgeon back into the river, you get that personal connection. So there the process of ecological restoration is actually much more about fixing human relationships. And not denying the reality, right, that settler colonialism in a highly vicious and insidious way destroyed the very basis of indigenous political, social, cultural, and economic systems. for season five for the rest of the summer. We can't be totally silent. We've got some bonus content planned for you all. However, we won't be releasing a long-form episode in July and August, but be sure to check back with us on the last Wednesday in September for our regularly scheduled programming. Thanks for listening. You can subscribe to the show anywhere you find your podcasts. Regardless of where you subscribe, please be sure to rate our show on Apple Podcasts. That's still the best way to help people find us. If you'd like more information about the topics we've discussed today, visit our show notes page for this episode at examiningethics.org. For updates about the podcast, interesting links, and more, follow us on Twitter, at Examining Ethics. And we should note that the views expressed here are the opinions of the individual speakers alone. They do not represent the position of DePaul University or the Prindle Institute. Examining Ethics with Andy Cullison is hosted by the Janet Prindle Institute for Ethics at DePaul University. Christian Weishart produced the show. Our logo was created by Evie Brocious. Our music is by Lache Swing and Blue Dot Sessions and can be found online at freemusicarchive.org. Examining Ethics is made possible by the generous support of DePaul alumni, friends of the Prendel Institute, and you, the listeners. Thank you for your support. You guys are prepared. I like you have boots, yeah. gear. <laughs> You have an umbrella. Hey, you're ready. <laughs> I'm not ready to be exploded.